It's a pleasure to, to share this lecture and some very personal work that I've been doing in the past few years here in USC. So um, I hopefully will be able to unpack some of those obscure ideas and, and try not to be too, too difficult, I guess. So if you have questions, please uh, address those. We will have some time at the end. Uh, and we could just yeah, uh, go through some of the ideas that I'll be presenting. I'm going to be talking about five main points. Um, in order to address the, the, the title of the, uh, the lecture, which is Exponential Design Strategy, I want to go through five points. The first one being uh, an idea of design resistance. Um, I'm currently working on a book um, called uh, The Blind Spot Initiative um, that has, uh, will be published by Ebolo uh, by the end of the year. And this uh, was a project um, that started as a Kickstarter that I did with Jason King and Diana Bogosian from here in USC. And we basically started thinking of how can we basically do an exhibition and a publication that would uh, criticize the competition model, right? Something that we're very familiar uh, as, as architects. And, and I was very kind of uh, troubled by the competition model in the sense of the amount of unpaid labor and certain kind of, I would say, unethical practices that surround uh, such a uh, notion, right? The idea that uh, it promotes secrecy among peers, uh, it devaluates the work of designers, and I was really thinking of how designers could actually find alternative modes of practice. The Kickstarter was our own entrepreneurial uh, approach uh, to create new work, to offer the knowledge of that new work, and, and basically try to put an exhibition and a publication with that. Um, I was very inspired in my research to look at the work of uh, Trevor Schultz, who, who describes the problems uh, of crowdsourcing and digital labor today. He is denouncing uh, websites like 99design. This is a crowdsourcing website that allows anybody to invent a new competition. Um, as he presented, uh, as an example in his book, um, if you have $300, right, you would be able to offer an icon, like a, a commission for over, over 200,000 designers that are already registered in the site. And you will get one winner, and you will basically not pay all the other people that work for free. Um, $180 of uh, that 300 that you put in will go to the winner, and 120 would actually go for the platform that is hosting this. So um, there's a lot of waste labor in this model. And it, this has kind of given rise to what we call today non-speculative work. There's a movement criticizing how this speculative work is really devaluating the, uh, the work of designers. He's also criticizing something like the Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, if you're not familiar with this, Amazon has a platform where anonymous uh, buy-ins create anonymous jobs that anonymous workers would actually perform. So what you're getting is a very, very low pay rates, and somehow you are starting to um, destroy many of the labor struggles that we had over the past uh, many years. As Scholz presented, uh, ideas of the Mechanical Turk are today uh, not taking consideration things like the, the eight-hour workday, paid vacations, health insurance, and child uh, labor, things that actually do happen within such platforms. So he's questioning how the internet is allowing for all these practices, unethical practices, to take place. Daniel Dendra, one of, uh, an architect more closer to our side, uh, he makes a similar analysis to what happens with architectural competitions, right? In 2002, he, he, this is a TED talk that he, he presents some of the, the metrics and the analysis that he's uh, giving. You had the Museum of Cairo competition um, where you had over 1,500 submissions. Uh, he calculates that if you have three architects working for a month, you would end up with like 4,600 people per month of work, and that's equivalent to the work of 10 architects' lifetime, right? So to get to a concept of, an uh, of a competition like what you see on the left, you needed the lifetime of 10 architects. Uh, again, putting the point in how unsustainable these practices are. We keep on having these competitions as a mainstream mode of work in architecture. Recently, the uh, Museum of uh, the Guggenheim Helsinki was a very bi vibrant competition and was one of the case studies in Harvard to talk about how competitions are really forming our practice. And I think that we really need to look critically of how these practices are impacting in a, in a kind of very unsustainable way the practice of architecture. So what we were trying to do with the exhibition is really look at alternative paths, right? What if we avoid and resist this model, and what else can you do there? Um, I was very surprised uh, that, that it was pretty easy to find many people actually addressing this issue in many different ways. 
One of the ways they were doing it, it was blurring the discipline boundaries. They were thinking slightly what you would say outside the box and thinking, well, what if we could just not do architecture but mix architectural ideas with other disciplines in order to address our own thinking, right? Um, so I basically put together uh, in the book, we're editing five chapters of how we're seeing the, hybrid, the hybridization of architecture with different disciplines like film, uh, product design, robotics and interactive design, software and exhibition and material installations. Examples of our architects have been uh, dipping into different fields from product design of small objects or product design at a different scale. Software design, we're often thought of not good engineers, but examples like Andy Payne are, are doing amazing work in terms of software, and I think that we are kind of getting in that field as well in a, in a very kind of prominent way. Film, um, not perhaps the most traditional films, but augmented reality speculation or ideas of how uh, scanning of a site could actually be presented in the, in the medium of film, and also interactive installations and robotics. So there's a series of new um, elements that are kind of redefining our discipline and it, they're blurring those boundaries, right? Again, things like material research and, and uh, installations are also a way of, of getting um, there. So we're celebrating in this publication the self-commission, an entrepreneurial approach, and, and how basically pushing some of this work that often it's not just a month, but it might be a much longer time of research, could actually be taken uh, and avoiding this, this perhaps this, this notion of the client in a competition structure. Um, the personal work that I did for uh, the Blind Spot exhibition, uh, again with the people from Summer Something, Jason King here present, uh, was called Dodo. It was an um, installation. We were thinking of a crowdsourced uh, installation. We had very little resources for, for such projects. So we basically did the bare bones of a steel structure that would be populated very slowly by the act of playing of people and threading and just basically adding to the structure. It was somehow of a so social experiment where we wanted everybody to contribute in their own degree to different colors and different layers. Uh, this is the result at the end of uh, the opening of the, the exhibition. And we expected it to keep on uh, adding layers as time passes through. Um, so with that note, I'm gonna just backtrack to, to a little bit where I started. Um, the second point I wanna talk about is, is what I call the abundance project. But it's another way of saying uh, and describe what is the plethora project, which is how I really started working. Um, the plethora project uh, is my practice. It started in a different way than a normal, um, let's say, architecture office. It really started from an academic uh, initiative. Uh, and it was looking at how online uh, education was happening in different places in the world, like what we call MOOCs or multi-online open uh, courses like things like Udacity, Coursera, all these platforms were offering videos of content for free and thinking that if we would have an infrastructure uh, of education that would be f uh, free and available, we would actually um, be able to, to increase education in a, kind of in, a, in a very strong way. So what does it mean? Technically, I started doing video tutorials. I started speaking to the screen and sharing everything that I was teaching, uh, all the content, I was putting it online. And today I have basically 200 or so video tutorials of architectural content, some of them quite obscure in the sense of the uh, programming or, or some of the more advanced techniques that I was working with. Um, but I also have a, a code library that allows others to, to work very quickly with some of the concepts without necessarily having to go through all the maps, right? Um, I guess that is important for me to really look at the metrics of this, uh, these videos. Um, Recently, I crossed the boundary of like a million views. Uh, obviously, for something like internet traffic is not much, but if you just look at, these are only the metrics of people that are actually looking at a video, right? Like people that are uh, finishing a lesson, and it's not just the traffic through a website, which is not necessarily what I'm interested in. Um, and, and you can see the demographics um, of the spread of that content. It's very important to see that the, the ideas and the propagation of ideas is, is you know, having a wider uh, spread. What, what comes out of this, it's not a very, uh, uh, something that you can touch in any way, but it's something like, like this one, like there's a workshop in New York. Um, they're quoting that they're kind of working with some of the material presented by me, so it allows others to do more work. And sometimes you have really beautiful examples of work. Um, this was a recent project that um, 
uh, a colleague from Portugal sent me. And, and I, I received this email which says, well, you know, I've been working with your libraries and your tutorials. Uh, please check out what I've been doing with it. And without really knowing it or even being part of this project, uh, he, he did all the kind of media installation for this, this performance piece uh, with the content, right? So I was really, really kind of surprised and happy to see how the work was actually reaching out and, and allowing others to, to work with that. And the center of this problem uh, or, or the initiative is the idea of propagation, right? How do we pass, uh, and you could argue that, well, education in general is, is doing this, but is really trying to, to look up ways in which this could actually be um, used as a metric and, and develop as a performance criteria for the research, right? Um, later, um, some of these ideas, which obviously was kind of the, the educational framework for, for working, I, I was able to put them in practice in projects. Um, and to start with, uh, I'll show a project that you're probably are familiar with, but it's still kind of important for the development of, of later projects. Um, the Bloom project we, I'm going to be showing, it's a, it starts with the notion of negative entropy, right? If we understand entropy as this measurement of disorder, as, as how order gets lost in a system, we could argue that design is precisely the, the opposite effect, is the effect in which we go from disassembled pieces to actually organizing them, and that's basically what we do. If you look at Lego, what is the difference between these two images, right? It's data, right? Where do pieces go? And energy, how do pieces get there, right? And that's basically what we're trying to, to do. Um, so how do we, we share and how do we propagate that information? The data required to assemble something and the energy to trigger such assembly. Lego does it by sharing this kind of document. We have our own blueprint, blueprints in architecture. But we have seen the proliferation of, of these kind of platforms, things like Instructable, where people are encouraging each other to, to tell how to do things. The DIY movement has been based on the idea of, of these kind of blueprints or, or instructables to, to share knowledge. The Bloom project um, has, was centrally, uh, uh, centrally based on, on these ideas. So it was literally thought as a giant Lego piece. It was literally just one unit that you, it would be quite flexible and asymmetric. So the kind of combinations that it would have with itself could allow for the um, generation of, of multiple patterns. Um, this is the production process. Uh, this is a steel mill uh, a piece that is placed in this machine. And through a process of injection molding, you end up with one of these units. As I said, you have like maybe six or, or five percent degree of flexibility on each unit. So as much as the rules are described by the geometry, you can always bend the rules and, and twist those rules uh, as you kind of grow the system. The idea was to create hundreds and thousands of these units and allow the people to play with them and discover patterns. So you can see this is some of the documentation that we were doing with the pieces, um, combining them in different uh, forms and, and sharing these, these uh, blueprints with the crowd to see what they could come up with. Um, obviously, the patterns that we anticipated were not nearly uh, all the patterns that were possible by the system. So we were planning to really show this project in different places in London for the London Olympics, uh, which was the commission we had um, for the project. And every time it would be presented, it would be different, and hopefully it would be organically changing by the act of uh, playing. So you can see how we are presenting it to the crowd, um, often idealizing what people would do with it, uh, and thinking that once we open it up, we would start seeing yeah, this kind of transformation. Um, what really happened is that initially it was something that uh, people thought it wasn't able, you, you couldn't touch it, that you would have to, it was just a sculpture. But once they realized that they could actually play with it, they would start creating all sorts of, of different things. Uh, for the most part, it was more, success, more successful when, when people could start from scratch. Like they really didn't want to engage in the large installation. And I think that there's something to be said that when a system is closed and it doesn't really allow for, for any kind of change, people feel a bit um, um, maybe challenged and they'd rather kind of search something small from scratch. Uh, and that's what people started doing, especially kids that would come day after day to really play with the project. Um, 
And you can see here that uh, the, the project is quite difficult to make something stable. It was within the interest of the project not to, to make it too easy so that you would actually be challenged to create larger structures and work with others. So obviously we've seen uh, people twisting the rules and breaking what we were expecting from the project being a very architectural project uh, into different directions, right? Like people doing all sorts of things. Uh, but we were documenting this in, and, and it was very exciting to see that people would really push the creativity and, and what you could do with it. Uh, funny examples of, of possibilities. But then people would actually maybe work with it at night and leave behind something like a creation, something like a sand castle that, that it stayed there and, and it was a, a token of participation. It would be like an example of something that someone did at, and, and was left for us, the designers, that would come the next day, clean a little bit the site, but most of the time we would leave and document some of these pieces that, that were just somehow, um, they would take quite a bit of time to, to play. And you've probably seen it here in USC, so you know how, how it works. So Bloom Today, we've been showing this project in, in several exhibitions um, in France, in other places in the, in the world, uh, here in USC as well. Uh, if you didn't have the chance, um, I have a few uh, opportunities to show you the project later on as well in different formats. Um, and in Australia, I mean, we in, in China as well, we had an exhibition. And But it's interesting to see that every time that we, we present the project, people, depending on the context and depending on the interest, they go in different ways and uh, take different shapes. One of the other uh, lines of work we've been doing with the project is uh, that of uh, education. We really kind of realized that the project serves as an uh, educational tool, um, being a, a kind of Lego that is not, as people say, not so uh, regimented or so regular. So you can really kind of think of ideas of pattern and sequencing in a different way. Um, and we, we've had a really great experience with how kids learn to use it and, and what they can create with it, obviously. Um, nothing spectacular, but, but obviously that process is, is kind of interesting. And, and until today, we have been developing this baby version or this mini version of Bloom, which uh, I'm happy to, to announce that we just got the, the packaging and some of the pieces. I, I brought some with me to if, if anybody's interested. But we are basically taking it into the market. Um, we. You know, it's been a long process to make a product out of it, a product that could actually be used in, in many different contexts. So we're talking with different museums to put it in stores, and if you're interested, you can certainly acquire it. Um, so this project was a cornerstone to think of design as play. Uh, the idea that uh, discovery and propagation of design patterns could be done both by a designer doing a system, but opening that system to a crowdsourcing uh, initiative. Um, I'm going to move to another project, uh, and with this project I would like to talk about the idea of prosumers. Um, the project is a project that was born completely here in USC, and it's a project that has been the, the result of working with students in my past two years, right? So um, some of the students that are here probably would see very closely that uh, their own work uh, in some of the slides. Um, this project started by, again, an analysis of what we consider architecture non-standard, right? After the Industrial Revolution, we, we've been celebrating the notion of the non-standard architecture as a, as a means for mass customization, file to factory protocols, and differentiation of parts. In this sense, architecture becomes a jigsaw puzzle, right? If we, we were able to differentiate every part of a building, you know, you end up with drawings like this one, that, that have specific notations for how to assemble those pieces into one unique form. So what the project Polyomino was trying to do is, is rethink the idea of this set and think of a non-holistic set. So hopefully I can explain what that means. We went back to Christopher Alexander, uh, and he has some key writings that express um, ideas uh, of systems, right? He has this particular uh, essay called Systems Generating Systems, where he described that within the word systems, there are two hidden ideas, right? The idea of the system as a whole and the kit of parts. And those two seem to be confused for one another. Um, his own work was the development of both, the development of kits of parts that would yield uh, holes and those patterns uh, as, as holistic systems. What we're trying to do within the polyomino agenda is to 
really rethink the, the notion of an open set as a set of parts and leaving the creation of patterns to a crowd uh, or a player in this case. So we've seen this strategy uh, being popularized by games and, and toys today. You have things like little bits, which are kind of these electric Legos that allow you to build circuits or these modular robots that you can combine in different ways where you can share some of the patterns that you have, uh, but you, the open set would allow a, a kid to, to really speculate with what uh, you could do. But all these ideas really were pioneered in the 60s. Uh, the Brown Electron Kit, I would say it's one of the key references. It was a project uh, that was presented as an electric domino that would allow kids to, to combine pieces to think of an electric, cir electric circuit. Right? All the pieces are magnetic, and they're sharing, they pass electricity among each other. So, so you could actually create a functioning radio just by combining these, these pieces and these bits one by one. So this is the way the brown electron was presented, right? You, you have a box with all the kit of parts, but there's no final solution. There's kind of a series of possible solutions or assemblies or patterns, right? But it's not a jigsaw puzzle. And I would like to contrast these two ideas, the idea that a closed set will always converge to one solution. And, and perhaps what we were trying to do is to open and think of these open sets um, as a room for uh, innovation. So Polyomino with the subtitle Reconsidering Serial Repetition with Combinatorics uh, comes of the notion that Polyomino is a series of square units arranged in a molecule, right? You might be familiar with uh, this uh, from Tetris. Tetris was popularized the idea of a Polyomino uh, where you would stack and combine these units in different ways. The central idea between, b behind a polyomino is that you're working with the combinations of a uh, finite set of units, right? You're not thinking of infinite variation, you're not thinking of parametrics. So I, I always make that distinction. We do not work with parametrics. The parametrics is a kind of mathematics that is very different from the combinatorics. And, and when you think of games, you think of crowdsourcing, combinatorial strategies seem to be far more interesting and more powerful for design. And this is something that we could discuss later, I guess. Um, I was very um, pleased to, to hear that uh, there was an experimental biennale happening in the Czech, Czech Republic in Prague, and they were interested on, on, on showing some of the work that we are doing with students in Polyomino. So in order to kind of go deeper into this project, I, I would like to share a video with you. Um, that I'll be showing in Prague next week, actually. So what you're seeing here are two pieces of software uh, developed within a game engine, right? So they run real time. It's important for us to think, uh, to create frictionless environments for design where someone with the skills of a game player uh, could actually play with these virtual objects. Uh, we are working with VR sets to, to really connect a virtual experience to a physical one. Um, we're also working with a 3D printing company uh, called Stratasys, 
that is sponsoring the production of uh, physical objects that emerge out of these uh, interactions, right? So what I call the from gaming to making research, it's a seamless connection between a gaming platform, which is a mass uh, media platform, with uh, 3D printing. What you can see here as well is, there's, as I said, there's two pieces of software. One of them is this black and white model, um, where the player can actually export and print directly a full assembly. We're thinking that the virtual environment is a place to quickly iterate over design ideas and patterns. And once you output it, you're basically uh, creating quickly a print, right? So this, this kind of shapes and these forms uh, which we think of them as pavilions, um, live in virtual space, but once they get materialized in physical space. Hopefully some of you have been able to see some of these units uh, or some of these in the exhibition we did in Acadia. The second piece of software is using a direct connection of, of the experience in the virtual space with the one that you have in the physical space, which we're, what we're doing is basically 3D printing the individual units and embedding magnets into them so that the experience of, of playing with them, snapping them and combine, combining them into this three-dimensional structure, it's both an act of uh, creation of structure and almost painting and defining uh, how these colors could be uh, working together. Right? This is a very kind of still a small prototype. Um, the 3D printing company Stratasys is kind of shipping a huge amount of these units for another exhibition future, so that project seems to be uh, still ongoing and, and hopefully we're going to get to share more of it in the future. As I said, we've been working with these two companies, um, the gaming platform and Stratasys, and thanks to both of those uh, that have enabled exhibitions and, and really uh, it's difficult to think that this research would be possible uh, without yeah, USC and, and the studio, uh, but also these companies that are enabling uh, some of this printing. Otherwise, we would just obviously stay only maybe in virtual space. Um, how we start doing this work, uh, we start looking at domino, right? At how units embed a data, a drawing that would represent the connectivity among units, uh, and things like space packing, right? What kind of geometries work uh, in a three-dimensional structure? And when you combine those two ideas together, you create uh, a three-dimensional domino, if you want, that describes voids and solid just by the data embedded in the parts. Um, this data, it's easily view and understood by a human player. We're not describing data that would be understood by an algorithm or a computer, but we're literally thinking of how can a human being really take this part and understand the logic that it has in relation to other units. So we inscribe a more complex geometry uh, in that octahedron, right? And, and that would allow us to create the patterns, right? So it's important to think on the notions of connectivity and, and the transmission of gravity and force through this structure, and the study of the patterns within the students, but opening it up as well to a larger community, and the results that we obviously enjoy as well. Um, so why do I call this uh, chapter, uh, um, and I use it to speak about prosumers? And I, here I want to quote someone like Jeremy Rifkin that uh, 
speaks and explains this, this phenomenon. Over the past decade, millions of consumers have become prosumers, producing and sharing music, videos, news, and knowledge at a near zero marginal cost and nearly for free, sinking revenues in the music, newspaper, and book publishing industries. What makes the social commons more relevant today is that we are constructing an Internet of Things infrastructure that optimizes collaboration, universal access, and inclusion, all of which are critical to the creation of a social capital and the ushering in of the sharing economies. So what Rifkin is describing here is the idea that what people used to be consumers of content could really become the new producers of content, right? And we are in the business, or perhaps my research is working with this idea to kind of enable others to really create value, not for one centralized, let's say, designer, but, but for themselves. And the parallel networks that are created, the peer-to-peer -peer networks that are created among these users as is what, what this work could actually enable. So to, to finish, uh, the final chapter is really address um, the title, which is Exponential Design. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about one particular project uh, uh, in this new chapter. Uh, if you are familiar uh, with video games, um, maybe you're not, uh, and architects often are not, um, you might uh, have heard perhaps of the game called Folded. This is a video game that uh, it's a um, protein folding video game that allows anyone to make scientific discoveries. What you're seeing here is a protein that has been modeled accurately from uh, a scientific model. And what players are doing is, is basically finding recipes and basically solving diseases, right? From uh, two weeks since it was released, Folded allow uh, the community to discover new patterns, new solutions that would advance science. And state-of-the-art algorithms have not been able to, to solve. So there was something to be said about combining um, the rigor of a game, in this case, um, with the intuition and data processing of a human. Other initiatives like uh, Minecraft have recently been working with the UN to, to rethink uh, disaster zones. Here is an example for the Block by Block initiative where Minecraft has been used to recreate and, to, and reconstruct neighborhoods uh, after a disaster. This is in Kathmandu. And there's been an ongoing interest on how video games could be used uh, by a larger set of people for urban design. Uh, part of the research uh, is also my interest in this particular project. So how do we start addressing some of these issues? Um, in the studio, uh, another work that we do is a, a work that I would describe slow computation. And what we do is to stop thinking of architectural models as models of representation of a building, but models that are uh, representing the system dynamics of, of what we're addressing in the city. So what we're doing here are creating board games, right? Games that uh, allow us to model how resources are passed, how agents interact among each other, and what are the events that trigger certain urban conditions, right? These are not necessarily representative. They're really trying to model how systems work. And what you can see here is that uh, students are encouraged to, to really kind of think of two things, right? How the system is described and how the system is played out. Iterating among those two, you start kind of understanding that there are kind of ways of tricking the system, exploiting the system, but also how to describe rules that are uh, often played out, in, in sometimes for cooperation, sometimes for competition. Um, some of those board games have become more close to what could be architecture and the development of, a, of an urban um, block or an urban unit, and the idea of how different, in this case, different agents, let's say different developers, would actually fight with each other to conquer uh, the space of, in this case, of a tower. So many different ideas are, be, uh, are being able to be modeled by these this simple board games, where if you think about it, you every turn that passes in the board game, you're doing a very few computation among the, the agents and the different participants, right? 
So we're not thinking necessarily that you would need an algorithm that would run hundreds and hundreds of computations, but we're slowing down to the point in which what are the meaningful interactions that these agents are having with each other, right? And how are these agents trying to either exploit the system or uh, benefit from it or, or collaborate, right? So I talk about trade-based systems as opposed to time-based systems. If you think in architecture, we've been highly influenced by the ideas of, let's say, Greg Lean and how form is derived from time and an evolutionary process. When you think of games, I, I would argue that you have to start thinking of trading as opposed to time-based, right? How the trading of data is passed among players. So these are some of the ideas uh, present in, in a work that I, I, I started maybe a year ago. Um, I put together a team uh, to go to Smart Geometry Conference in Hong Kong. Um, the team was uh, Satoru Sugihara from SciArc, uh, Sergio Irigoyen from London, and myself. And the idea was to deal with the city of Kong, Hong Kong and its urban complexities, um, how dense it is, and how you can actually think of the rules that describe such a structure. So this is a very early prototype of, of, of the game. Uh, just in the dark. There we go. Um, so this is a very early prototype of the game uh, that we presented for Smart Geometry. This is a very small workshop uh, scenario where we were able to explore some of these ideas, right? So we would have a very small grid that would represent a neighborhood and you would be able to add units to uh, simulate what that kind of, uh, the ecology of such a neighborhood would produce. The ideas behind the game were influenced by, by initiatives like the plan in Chicago. This is an urban farming facility uh, that focuses on the notion of the um, diminishing of waste, right? So every unit in the plant uh, is being thought of how the waste that it's producing becomes the input for another one, right? So the example of aquaponics is that vegetables uh, residues could become the food of um, fish, right? And the other way around. So it's a, it's a symbiotic system. The plant is actually taking that analogy to the whole building and even all the waste is being used for heating and, and, and creating the electricity for the building. So that was an, a, a beautiful example of, of, of ideas of ecology in a very interesting way. Um, other great influence was the whole Earth Catalog. Uh, similar to what Instructables were doing, the whole Earth Catalog is a, is a publication in the 60s that was basically showing a series of different technologies. Um, it would just be a catalog of them. You would be able to, to realize, oh, maybe I didn't know about this technology. Uh, maybe Bucky Fuller would show you how to do a, a geodesic dome, and this is, he was heavily uh, part of the catalog. But when I looked at the catalog, I always thought, well, wouldn't it be great to have this almost as a set of cards? Right? What if I could just break this catalog apart and start playing with it and combining those units in a way, maybe this one has some synergy with this other one, or I could combine it with this third one, and that would become something new. So I decided to restart uh, the game project. I called it Blockhood, and I've been working on this project for the last year, um, and it hasn't <laughs> been an easy task uh, because I definitely haven't been doing kind of professional game design uh, as until this point. Um, so for this, I will show you the audio. Uh, this is one of the tra recent trailers that we have for the game.
So the game is focused on two main mechanics. Um, those are the ones from ecology and entropy, right? Um, so ecology, what do I mean by that is every unit, it's producing a resource. We have a, a large uh, number of resources that you can create. So something like a solar panel would actually create electricity. But something like a, an apartment block would need that resource to uh, produce its own set of resources, right? So there's an interdependent web of how these re resources are passed uh, among the, the, the units, right? Um, if a unit doesn't have enough resources to produce its own resources, then that unit will start decaying. So that, that's where uh, entropy comes in. Um, what happens is my unit starts decaying, it slowly it starts losing its properties, it starts losing, it starts getting abandoned to the point it would actually get destroyed. You are somehow surviving a notion of, of abandonment, right? So this is what happens if you don't care about ecology in the game. You're, this is a kind of the, the end game condition where you lose, basically, the game over experience, perhaps. But you, you can always kind of go back and start thinking, well, if I didn't do so well that time, maybe I can try again and, and start addressing some of these issues in a maybe more thoughtful way. Um, units also describe adjacencies with each other, right? So some units would actually be positive. You have, let's say, public space or green areas closer to apartments. Those would actually be positive, so it would boost production. But then you can also have poisons, right? Like how do a, a unit could actually be negative with another, and you want to avoid or keep distances, right? So the placement of units is, is important in that sense as well. The notion of currencies or game currencies and resources is something that we like uh, been fleshed out quite quite a lot. If you look at games like uh, SimCity, um, most of the kind of current city building games have very broad categories of money, water, electricity, and those are the resources that a city uses. Uh, I thought of a game that, that could be really scalable and that could be really very granular in the sense of the use of resources. So if you want to think of a winery, right, you might be thinking of how grapes become a resource, what is the fermentation time, and that could be modeled into the units, and those are kind of passing a series of very, very specific resources to create uh, a small ecology among those. And you don't have to be thinking in broad terms of food, energy, and, and water as being the main one. So there's a lot of depth that you can actually have by, by having very, very precise uh, currencies. And you can also speculate what, what if we would have a currency that we currently we don't have, right? What if uh, we would have some sort of eco points for something else? Or, or there's different things that the engine would allow you to think of, and how would that affect the system? So there's interesting um, ideas that have come out from, from the process of developing this game. Um, so this is kind of how the game is presented to a player. You can see this, this kind of floating island, which is a partial view of a city. Uh, it's a small neighborhood. But the, the player at all times can actually switch and see some of the data. This is in green. You're seeing units that are actually producing. So they're kind of uh, satisfying their input data. And the units that are not, right? So which units are actually having problems? The units that are having problems will show you also their decay data, right? How much uh, resilience is left for them to ultimately be destroyed and abandoned, right? So the player can actually see that data as well. So and those are the two main mechanics. But the game also has two sub-mechanics, which is uh, the idea of structure. So you can see the data of how structure is happening. It's a very simple structural calculation that has to do with cantilevering, right? So if you cantilever one or two times, that unit cannot hold anymore, right? You need to create support for that. And you can see here in white, uh, the units that are kind of at its maximum or at its peak of, of uh, they cannot resist any further aggregation, while the blue ones are really strong ones and are holding up the structure. And access, this is the final metric uh, that the game allows you to, to play with. If you don't provide access to a, a particular kind of building unit, that unit won't produce, it won't be occupied. It's a series of implications. So you wanna be making sure that there's enough connectivity and circulation. And this is four of the main uh, data modes that the game is allowing currently but we're also thinking of other metrics that could be influenced like orientation and, and some um, impact and so on. Um, as the game has been described or compared to things like Sim Tower, uh, back in the day, uh, the creator of Sim City, Will Wright, did a, a beautiful game called Sim Tower, but the game Blockwood really doesn't imply that you're building a tower. Uh, it's really allowing you to think of a neighborhood in, in any direction, right? Um, and I would argue that the, the notion of ecology is perhaps more interesting and more, more relevant than the tower itself. Um, but you can definitely do the tower. Uh, here we have an image 
of, of a night view um, because the game is also taking in consideration a season and a day-night cycle, right? Uh, the production of units changes as, as it changes at different seasons and you have to start using uh, a smart notion of how, how these kind of uh, resources are produced during time, understanding the life cycle uh, of the building. So here I confront some of the ideas of this partial emergent urbanism that could come out from the interaction of parts versus what would be a holistic notion of a city and, and the notion of a master plan. Um, if you think of the, of the work that has been presented uh, before, in, in most cases we're thinking of these open systems as partial, uh, systems of partial information where they do not kind of address uh, the building as a whole, but they're building systems that kind of need to be integrated into other systems. Um, just as a kind of a maybe side note, um, where we are with this game currently, we um, launch a, uh, a green light campaign. Um, if you don't know what that is, uh, Steam is one of the biggest, uh, if not the biggest, uh, game platform for PC games. And we're basically preparing a two-month campaign to actually get enough votes to actually be able to sell the game and put it in the market in the interest of really um, addressing a, a large community. The game wouldn't be uh, so interesting if we don't have a community really playing and, 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 and giving us feedback of what they can do with the game. We were very surprised that within six days of uh, starting this campaign, we, we got the green light. We actually got enough votes and enough commitment from people to, um, to develop that community, and there was an interest of what the game was offering. So we were very happy with that. Um, and a game often gets a 40% approval. We were over 75. So that allows us to really launch the game by the end of the year. Um, so what is this idea of exponential design? Uh, we saw this diagram before with the Plethora project and how the work, one seed of work can really enable someone else to start replicating and adding layers and, and not only learning but, but taking that game, uh, the work forward. I think that that idea could actually be done recursively, right? It could be done over and over and it would actually branch out. The impact that we can have with initiatives that are inclusive and, and open could be as I think of it, exponential. Um, and I want to e end with a final short chapter that I'm describing flavor. Uh, and I think that you could be thinking, well, isn't there a double standard here among your criticism towards competitions at the beginning, but then using crowdsourcing as your main uh, ideas for all your projects, right? And I think that as Scholz is presenting it, um, I would like to read this quote. Uh, Today, communications is made of a social production facilitated by new capitalist imperatives, and it has become increasingly difficult to distinguish between play, consumption, production, life and work, labor, and non-labor. Um, the idea of labor and the concentration of capital, that something like the competition model, is something that we should challenge. And if we consider these practices to be unethical, I consider that we are called to actually design new platforms that actually could do something different. Um, within my uh, work, I believe that there's a strong interest to kind of question. Not all the questions have been figured out, but there's an interest of designing platforms that would empower others as opposed to create, as I said, concentration of capital and just benefit these uber millionaires in Silicon Valley. So with that, thank you.